ministers knew that they were lying, the ministers knew they were lying, they would say, well, no, you have to, your target's 50. Okay? So they, they, would, they would lie to one another. And um, because the, the incentive was that the manager wanted to ex- just exceed his target and, and get a bonus, but not too much, because then they, they, they always raise it the next year if you exceeded the target. So um, what happened there? Well, when you have gross output planning, you can specify the units that should be produced, but you, it's very hard to specify the exact quality and type of unit. So what we found in, in, um, in Russia, was there were many unfinished houses throughout the country. Uh, they were completely built, except that they had no, uh, no, no roofs. Why didn't they have any roofs? Because small roofing nails were not being produced. Why weren't small roofing nails being produced? Because the output target for the nail industry was specified in terms of tons. So everybody made really big nails because it was easier to meet the uh, target that way. And there was a famous joke in a Russian um, magazine, a uh, cartoon. I love this cartoon. I actually drew that. Okay. That's the people's train. That's uh, the guy on the right with the smaller hat because he's lower down. He doesn't have that big, um, that, that big fur hat that they wear in Russia, right? That, that's, the, that's the minister of the industry. Um, Matt Mahai, if he's here, also wears hats like this. Um, so, uh, in any case, he's pointing to that nail and he's saying, well, comrade, I met my target. He produced one giant nail. Now, that's an exaggeration, but that's what gross output planning led to. Um, there was a famous speech by Khrushchev, um, which got into the Western press, in which he began berating, uh, during a party, party meeting, the chandelier producers. Now, why were they doing that? Well, it turned out that, um, I guess they're called dashas, these very expensive villas on the Black Sea where the, um, the um, apparatchiks, the communists, uh, you know, uh, higher ups in the Communist Party lived. Um, they're being killed because the, the, um, the chandeliers are so heavy, they're pulling down the, the ceilings and, and, and crushing people, uh, you know, when they were having feasts and stuff. Why was that? Well, because the production of chandeliers was specified in terms of, of, of pounds of chandeliers or tons of chandeliers or whatever the unit was, okay? Um, and, and when Western economists would go to Russia, they would hear um, the, the Russian, you know, they would be kidding with their colleagues. Uh, and, and this goes back to something that, that Khrushchev, you know, the, the premier at the time, the 1950s, uh, did at the United Nations. There's a famous story, and you may have seen a, a um, I, I think I think I have it on film, uh, where he's, ba- he's banging his shoe on the podium and saying, we will bury you, uh, meaning we will bury the West economically, Okay. Um, because our system is so much more productive. Obviously, he didn't read Mises' pamphlet. Um, but in any case, the joke was, uh, the Western, the, the Russian economists would tell the Western economists, we will bury you, but we're going to leave Hong Kong, because we need at least some prices. Okay? We need, we need, we need some prices to calculate. So now it turned out, um, that, that people, Mises had been, cal- had been, um, criticized. Because he claimed that socialism was impossible. And yet, okay, this joke bears on, on the following. Uh, the, the, what people would say, well, look, the Soviet Union, uh, you know, has existed since 1917, you know, it's 1950s or 60s. How could, Mises was clearly wrong. There's still, there's still the, so, the Soviet Union in existence. And in fact, there's other socialist countries in existence. But what was very interesting was that Mises in that very first article said that the Soviet Union today, and that was written in 1920, is not a real socialist economy because it exists in a sea of market prices, of, of world market prices. So they can roughly calculate, even though they're not the price of their specific goods, they can roughly calculate the price of steel. They can roughly calculate the price of electricity, especially in, uh, in the case of things that are traded internationally. It's easy for them to observe those prices. Um, so uh, the Soviet Union itself engaged in foreign trade. Okay, Basically, the Soviet Union was just a giant corporation, monopoly corporation, that sold coal, gold, and oil, and gas on world markets. So it knew those prices. So we could use prices in a rough way, okay? Not in the same way that a, a free market entrepreneur would. So the Soviet Union, Mises says, is like the post office, right? The post office is extremely inefficient in the United States, okay? But they can still calculate. They can still copy low-cost technology, which is what the Soviet Union did, okay? From outside the post office system. So as bad as the, as, as the post office was, that's how bad the Soviet economy was. There's another thing that they did. Um, there was a thoroughgoing black market system 
um, between Russian factories. Factories that were, were striving to meet their targets sometimes would run short of certain products or of certain inputs. So what they would do is that they would send out uh, these sort of semi-black market uh, dealers that would go and, and find what they needed and then trade excess materials that, that their factory had. So there would be a, there'd be trading and there would be market prices, at least in terms of, of, of goods or even maybe in terms of rubles. So there would be a whole system of bribes and black markets that were keeping the, was keeping the Soviet Union going. It was called BLAT, B-L-A-T, which was a system of bribes. Also, by the 1980s, Western goods were being smuggled in like crazy. Um, Western jeans, for example, um, being smuggled in and sold in terms of dollars. They were going for $300. Beatles records were being smuggled in and so on. So, so there was also this, this thriving black market. Um, also, the, um, the Soviet government allowed a very small, uh, more or less free market agricultural sector. Okay, and that provided like something you know like two percent of of the agricultural land was it private. People could have small gardens, but it, it, it you know produced like thirty or forty percent. I forget the figures now of, of 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 the of the goods. So there were prices there that they could look at and copy. There's also a story. I don't know how true this is that um, in in the 1950s, um, uh, Maoist China was was madly ordering Sears catalogs and Montgomery Ward catalogs so they could copy the prices. Okay, um, yeah. So they, because they were blind, as Mises said, without prices. They were totally blind. What's interesting, of course, is that um, mainstream economists, even as late as the late 1980s, were saying that the Soviet Union was going to close the uh, gap on us in terms of per capita income. And Paul Samuelson, who uh, was, I think, won the second Nobel Prize in economics, and was, uh, whose textbook was the leading textbook for many, 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 many decades, from the early 1950s onward, um, had the following interesting diagram. Let me put it up there for you. Oops. Yeah, zoom in on it. Okay. Not tight. What this diagram, see that cone? See, this, this is the cone of the, of, of the possible growth rates, or likely growth rates of the U.S. from 1976 to 2005. Now, this was written in uh, 1989, I believe. So what he's saying is that the per capita income of the USSR, okay, now the USSR cone is the darker cone. See it up there? There was a possibility that by 2005, their growth rate would be higher than the U.S. growth rate. Uh, I'm sorry, not growth rate, per capita income rate. They would be richer, okay, than the U.S. would be. And, of course, they completely collapsed like a year or two later. And this, he, he <laughs> um, and by the way, this was, a lot of this was based on CIA data. It was just nonsense. In fact, a, a, a friend of ours, Yuri Mulsov, who's a friend of the, um, the Institute, made the point that uh, he, he, he calls himself the last defector because he got out right before the whole thing collapsed. Great entrepreneurship on his part. Um, but for about six months, he was very popular. He was an economist that you know, had escaped in the Soviet Union. But what he said was that when they added up their GDP figures, they just added up, they added up um, uh, unlike the U.S., they would add the steel as well as the cars that the steel produced, whereas we would net the steel out because we would consider it double counting. So they, they would, and, and a lot of the steel and other things that were being produced, raw materials, were just piling up and never going into consumer goods. But that would be added up. So the CIA was saying, oh, the, you know, the, the country's getting stronger and, you know, they're going to have more military might and so on. They were just bogus statistics. And, in fact, Mises predicted this. He said, the machine, it's an irrational machine that just keeps turning and producing things that no one, no one wants. Okay? Women, women's clothes, since it was on, on the gross output planning, were all huge sizes. Petite women couldn't find decent dresses in Russia. Okay? So it was just, it was a mindless machine, just kept producing things, but nothing that people really wanted. And um, the things that people really did want, for example, um, if you saw the movie uh, Moscow on the Hudson, um, people were lined up at the beginning of that movie, the Robin Williams movie. What were they lined up for? Well, they were lined up for toilet tissue. Okay? And it would know, take a long time to get toilet tissue. And, and, and the joke was um, that uh, you know, a Western would see a Russian get on a very long line with no end in sight, you couldn't see what was at the end of the line, why people lined up, and, and, and uh, so they would ask the Russian, why are you getting on this line? What's at the other end? The guy says, well, I don't know, but it must be good if it's a long line.